hard to believe, but it's been a little over three years since I first uploaded a video about the Game Boy Zero project. Since then, there have been a lot of options pop up for custom parts for making one, kits for making similar projects, and even finished products. So today I'm going to show you three of those options. The G-Pi case from Retroflag, the Game Shell from Clockwork Pi, and the Circuit Sword from Kite. And Retroflag is actually giving away one of these on the channel. These aren't even out yet. So I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. I'm going to be comparing them in terms of how difficult they are to put together, performance and what different emulators are able to run, battery life and the software running them. Now before I get started, full disclosure, they did send me each of these but they didn't pay me anything, they didn't tell me anything specific to say in this video. These are just my honest thoughts about each of these. And this is probably going to be one of my longer videos so get comfy and let's get started. So first I'm going to show you how each one goes together. These aren't intended to be comprehensive build guides, I just want to give you an idea of what to expect. First up is the G-Pi case from Retroflag. This actually isn't even out yet, it'll be out at the end of May, and it's a Game Boy type shell for the Raspberry Pi Zero or Zero W. I've been a fan of theirs for a while, they've made some great Super NES and NES style cases for Raspberry Pis, and like I mentioned in the beginning, they're giving away one of these before it's even released, so check the link in the description if you want to enter. Here's everything it comes with. This is kind of an odd choice. They used a barrel style connector on the other end of this USB cable instead of micro USB or something more common. Here's our hardware, got some brass inserts and a micro USB adapter. And here's the GPI case itself. And right away, man, this thing feels nice. It really feels like an original Game Boy, just a little bit smaller. Headphone jack at the bottom, volume wheel where you'd expect it and contrast wheel on the other side, which actually controls the brightness. And that barrel style power port. L and R buttons cleverly hidden on the back, I really like that. And here's the biggest gripe I have about this whole thing. Double A batteries. Why? That is such a weird choice to make in 2019, so eh. Now if you look closely in here you can see a micro USB port, which they say on their website is for updating firmware. Then there's this cartridge style shell that slides out and that's what you actually install the Raspberry Pi in. So yeah, all you need in addition to the kit is a Raspberry Pi Zero and an SD card. They used springy Poco style pins similar to what we saw in the Tiny Pi Pro, so there's no soldering involved. And putting it together only takes a few minutes, the instructions are really clear, all you need is a screwdriver, which it even comes with, and that's it. So they sent me a pre-configured SD card but it sounds like they expect you to take a fresh install of RetroPie and do a little bit of setup on that to make it work in here. More on that in just a minute. Speakers nice and loud and I have to say the screen is gorgeous. Nice and crisp, smooth 60 frames per second, looks fantastic especially on a game like Sonic where everything is moving really fast. They're not using the HDMI port on the Pi so I'm assuming it's a DPI screen. It's a little bit smaller than a normal Game Boy. I measured and it's right at 11% smaller, which I actually really like, it makes it easier to carry around, it's just slightly larger than a Game Boy Pocket. Safe shutdown works exactly like you'd expect it to. Next up is the Game Shell from Clockwork Pi. It's got a quad-core Cortex-A7 CPU, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, an Atmega 168P chip that you can reprogram, a gig of RAM, comes with a 16 gigabyte micro SD card, has micro HDMI out, and a 1200 milliamp hour battery. Here are the parts that come in the kit. The shell itself feels really nice, and it's a nice size. You'll notice there are no screw holes, instead they've got these little circular fasteners that attach here. I'll show you how those work in a minute. But it's clear that they're trying to make this as easy to put together as possible without any tool. This is the main board, the CPU is an all winner R16, and a fun fact, that's the same kind of chip used in the NES and Super NES classics from Nintendo. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip, and then on the other side there's a micro SD card slot, connector for the LCD, connectors for things like the battery and keypad, and then on the top is a headphone jack, micro USB charging, micro HDMI, and power button. Here's the button board, pretty simple on this side, but on the other side is that Atmega chip, which you can reprogram as you would any Arduino using this micro USB port. So that's cool, you could use that I guess to make peripherals with more buttons or sensors or whatever, using all these input pins at the bottom and here on the sides. This silicone pad goes on top of the buttons, and then on top of that go some small plastic caps. 
The screen is a 2.7 inch 320 by 240 TFT. Interesting connector here, similar to what you'd find in a laptop. Board for the battery to connect to. This one is for the speakers, which have little spring connectors that press against it. And then this board is what you'd use for your L and R buttons. I don't know how I feel about this. I'll show you why in a minute. This is kind of cool. There's an alternate back that you can put on it that has dots on it for attaching peripherals. And they're Lego sized, so you could actually use Lego bricks to make an attachment if you wanted to. And it's kind of appropriate too, since the whole kit kind of goes together like a Lego set. Bag with all of our cables, SD cards, and speakers. And then a couple sheets like this that go together to make little enclosures for each of the boards. Makes it this kind of modular system. I love the idea on paper, but we'll see how well it actually works. Each of these shell parts is labeled for which module it goes to, so that makes it pretty simple. They snap together and you just drop the corresponding component in there. No soldering, no screws even. It's a pretty clever setup and it makes it really accessible for people who might not otherwise attempt hardware projects. The buttons have hard caps that you place on top of the silicone mat. I should note that I moved around the ABXY buttons to what I think is the proper arrangement. And I was kind of skeptical about how these would feel, but they're not bad, especially when you get it in the case. And there's really not much to say for putting these modules together. Again, you just drop the parts in and snap them shut. So then you'll start connecting all the modules to the main board. Hardest one is the screen. I had to fiddle with that stupid connector for a few minutes to get it seated. It would have been a lot easier if I would have thought to do it with the main board outside of the shell. Otherwise, pretty simple. The instructions tell you which wires go where. And then there are these little silicone spacer things. They help hold things in place and keep them from rattling around. Then those circular fasteners go on both sides to hold everything together. And again, I was pretty skeptical about the buttons, but they are not bad at all. D-pad is a little bit mushy, I guess, but otherwise they're fine. So here's my biggest gripe about the whole kit, that L and R board. The buttons themselves are fine, but they go in this separate module and attach to the back using these L-shaped Lego pieces. But they stick out like this. I have no idea why they chose to do it this way. It would make a lot more sense to have them face outward, but even if they went that route, why not just build them into the shell? I feel like it's a really weird choice for sure. Last but not least is the Circuit Sword from Kite. This one uses a Game Boy shell just like the original Game Boy Zero did. This board here is the Circuit Sword itself, which is similar to other all-in-one boards for the Game Boy Zero project, but cranked up to 11. So you see this slot here, this is where the Raspberry Pi goes. It doesn't use a Raspberry Pi Zero like a lot of these kinds of builds, it uses a Raspberry Pi Compute module. This is basically a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus crammed onto this little board. So it's much more powerful than Raspberry Pi Zero. And it just slides into this slot and clicks down. You don't have to solder it in or anything like that. Super nice. It's got a USB Type-C charging micro SD card slot that you can access from outside of the shell. This is a Wi-Fi module since the compute module doesn't have that built in. Headphone jack at the bottom. This chip here is an Atmega 32U4 that takes care of things like button presses, monitoring battery levels, as well as some other things. There are a few JST style connectors on the board. These two are for analog sticks, so you can use a PSP or 3DS style analog stick if you want to, which is nice since the B Plus can emulate PlayStation perfectly and even a lot of N64 games. I've got an aftermarket case, you can get them in all kinds of colors, and even some custom shapes like this one from Kitsch Bent. Same thing with the buttons. I'm also using a glass screen lens. You can get those in a few different styles from a couple of places. I'll link to those in the blog post. I'm using the Megabat from Helder. It's 4,500 milliamp hours and it lasts a ridiculously long time. And it'll actually fit inside the battery bay with just a little bit of trimming. The screen is a three and a half inch DPI screen, so it's crystal clear and 60 frames per second. And I'll also be using a few 3D printed parts designed by people in the community. I'll link to all of that in the blog post. Now there's a lot more work involved in this build. You have to modify the shell for things like charging port, X and Y buttons, analog sticks if you're adding those, the larger screen, L and R buttons, and the battery. None of it is really difficult per se, it's just time consuming, especially if you want to take your time and make it look nice. This little board has the power switch and function menu button. There's a little bit of soldering involved. I know that's something that a lot of people worry about with these projects, but none of it is difficult. It's just the speaker, the L and R buttons, which I actually wound up adding a second pair, so I had L2 and R2. 
and then the analog stick if you're using that. So if you're new to soldering, you don't need to worry, this would actually be a good project for beginners. This 3D printed screen bracket makes it really easy to assemble. You just glue it in place, add your buttons, drop the board in, and plug in your analog stick and speaker. The kits used to come with fans, but now that's optional. It does come with a heatsink though. For attaching the screen lens, I just used some thin strips of double-sided tape, just like the previous one I did. As I mentioned, I added a second L and R button board to mine for L2 and R2 so I can play PlayStation games. I modified the printed part model for this, and again, I'll share that in the blog post. This long, thin board on the side here has a USB port and a mini HDMI port, so you could play it on your TV with the USB controller if you wanted to. There are a few printed cartridges like this one, which has vents for airflow. Kind of nice, but I'm keeping it simple and using a cut-up cartridge. The two halves of the case connect with this ribbon connector you see in the middle, and after you connect the battery, you can close it up. And if you had an original Game Boy, then I'm sure you've seen this sticker before. So yeah, as I said, quite a bit more work involved in this build, but you could still do it in a weekend easily, and I love the customization options you get. So next, the question that I think most people are probably wondering about, how powerful are each of these and what different systems can you expect to play on them? I didn't do any really scientific testing. I didn't think that it would be very useful to know, for example, if PlayStation 1 ran on one of these 2% faster than on the other. I think all anyone really cares about is which systems they can reasonably expect to play. So let's start with the GPi case. It's running a Raspberry Pi Zero, so a lot of you probably already know what to expect which is to say pretty much anything up through Super NES and Game Boy Advance. I've heard a lot of people say that the Pi Zero struggles with those systems, and it's true that you may run into a game here and there that it struggles with, but I found that if you take the time to try out different emulation cores, which you can change by pressing a button as a game is launching, a lot of times you can find one that works great. For example, here I'm running a Game Boy Advance game using the default emulator core. You can see it's struggling, but when I switch to using GPSP, it runs nice and smooth. N64 and PlayStation are both well out of reach, however. There may be a few games that run alright, but here you can see it really struggling with Final Fantasy VII. The game shell was kind of a mixed bag. On paper, I thought it would do much better than the Pi Zero that's in the GPi case, since it has four CPU cores and a gig of RAM, versus the Pi Zero's single core and half a gig. It handles Super NES and Game Boy just fine, I did have to play around trying a couple of different cores though, but when I tried Sega Genesis, it was annoyingly slow, and I tried the only other Genesis emulation core that I could find, but for whatever reason, that one just crashed whenever I tried to launch it. It should be able to handle this without breaking a sweat, so it could be that we'll see a more optimized core at some point, but funny enough, PlayStation 1 runs fantastically on it, but you'll definitely need those annoying trigger buttons. That brings us to the Circuit Sword with its Raspberry Pi 3 chip in it. And as you might expect, compared to the other two, this thing is a beast. Nearly everything that I threw at it ran great, even without having to mess with different emulation cores. Super NES, Genesis, Game Boy Advance, and PlayStation were all flawless. 3D platformers were especially nice with the analog sticks, so if you're making one of these, I highly recommend doing the extra work to add one of those. and it's the only one that was able to handle a lot of N64 games. N64 is sort of the holy grail of handheld emulation as it's notoriously difficult to emulate. So I'm sure that you'll run into some games that don't work very well at all, but most of the ones I was interested in all ran great. Even Ocarina of Time and Goldeneye ran respectably well on it, even if they weren't full speed. Next up, battery life. I set up each of them running Super Metroid's demo loop with an appropriately Game Boy shaped clock and took a time lapse. The game shell cut off at 2 hours and 20 minutes, followed by the GPi case at 2 hours 52 minutes. And then the Circuit Sword with its Megabat from Helder lasted 7 hours and 45 minutes. I ran the same test again, this time with wireless disabled and brightness and volume turned down some. The game shell did a little bit better than last time, 2 hours and 46 minutes. The GPack case got 3 hours and 12 minutes, but there was actually about 40 minutes after that that the GPI case kept trying to boot up. That can't be good for your SD card, so don't fall asleep while you're playing it. 
Then the circuit sword lasted an absurd 9 hours and 35 minutes. That's nuts. There was one more test that I wanted to do, which was running the GPI case on rechargeable nickel metal hydride batteries. I wasn't expecting them to last as long as regular alkaline batteries that I'd used, but to my surprise, it lasted 4 hours and 46 minutes. So if you get one of these, rechargeables are definitely the way to go. Next up is the software. Now both the GPI case and the circuit sword are running RetroPie, which is kind of the go-to software for Raspberry Pi based projects like this. So there's not really a ton to differentiate them software wise under the hood. It is worth mentioning that the GPI case seems to expect users to install a couple of scripts on top of a fresh install RetroPie to get things like the safe shutdown switch working. They sent me a pre-set up image. Their image took forever to boot up, almost two minutes. But again, you'll be adding their software on top of your own install of RetroPie, so you could get that down well under a minute with some tweaking. But other than that, it's plain old RetroPie, and there's nothing wrong with that. My biggest gripe with their software, and this is probably a combination of a hardware and a software complaint, there's no battery monitoring, so you have no idea where exactly the battery level is at any given time. The best you get is this blinking light when it starts to get low, which seems to blink faster as it goes lower, but that still makes you guess as to how low the battery actually is. Kite, on the other hand, has a pre-built RetroPie image that you just download, burn onto an SD card, and you'll be good to go. It does have a couple of custom features like a battery gauge and Wi-Fi status in the corner, and then the button on the side brings up a nice on-screen menu that he's got running in the background to control things like Wi-Fi, brightness and volume, and there's even an on-screen keyboard that you can access if you need to type anything into the terminal or enter Wi-Fi credentials. Really nice touch. Other than that, again, it's RetroPie. Now the game shell is running a custom Linux distribution that takes just under 30 seconds to boot up. And it has a pretty nice launcher that I was actually impressed with. It has battery and Wi-Fi gauges at the top. They made it super easy to connect to Wi-Fi with an on-screen keyboard, adjust various other settings and update the launcher software. It's got a built-in server for transferring files over FTP or Samba. And there's even a built-in music player, which I wouldn't really use, but it has a headphone jack on the top, so why not? It comes with a few open source games like Cave Story and Tyrion. And even though it's not installed, there's a launcher for Pico 8 right on the main menu, which is sort of a virtual console and platform for making 2D games. I think I know why they're putting this front and center even though it's not even installed. I'll tell you about that in a minute. It has a few standalone emulators built in, but I had much better luck just using RetroArch, which supports a lot more consoles and is also pre-installed. So which one do I recommend? Well, it's not as easy a question to answer as you might think. It depends on a few things like how much money you want to spend, how much effort you want to put into making it, and which systems you care about emulating. I really think that each one of these caters to a specific kind of person. If you just want something that works, the GPI case is by far the easiest to put together and the cheapest too. It's going to be $69 when it releases at the end of May. So you add a Raspberry Pi Zero to that and an SD card, you're looking at about $85, bucks, which is awesome considering what you're getting and how nice this thing feels to play on. Just make sure that you understand the drawbacks, which in my mind, at the top of the list is the fact that it runs on AA batteries. I don't understand that one. Also keep in mind the limited horsepower that you get with the Raspberry Pi Zero. If you're mostly interested in just 16-bit games and back, you'll be just fine. If customization and do-it-yourself assembly appeal to you, then the circuit sword is definitely the way to go. It takes the most work to put together and it's the most expensive, and bear in mind that it only comes with the boards for the project. You're gonna need to get the case, the buttons, the battery, all that stuff. You're looking at between $200 and $250 depending on what parts you choose. But it is by far the most powerful and you get to customize just about everything about the appearance and even the input options. You can put analog sticks on it if you want. I've seen people do six button layout similar to a Sega Genesis. Just go to the show off corner in the Pseudomod forums and you'll see a huge variety in the types of builds that people are putting together. I love that about it. These can be kind of hard to get a hold of, so if you want one, definitely follow Kite on Instagram. He always announces pre-orders when he opens them. So that leaves us with the game show, which, as you might have gathered, is kind of an oddball. For what it is, it's kind of expensive. Right now it's $160 on their site, and that's actually on sale. The performance was kind of a mixed bag, but to be fair, that could change in the future, and I expect that it probably will, especially when you consider that it's running the same chip that's in the Super NES and NES Classics. The kinds of things that modders have been able to do with that software-wise is pretty awesome. And then there's those L and R buttons, which are just, they're just terrible. But even with those negatives, 
I still kind of like it and I found myself picking it up to play it. I think that the person who this would appeal to is someone who wants to put together a kit but either can't or doesn't want to touch a soldering iron or a Dremel. You can put this thing together with zero tools whatsoever. It also seems like they're really trying to pitch themselves to people who might be interested in learning to program, specifically making games. I mean, they list it as a feature that you can reprogram the button board using Arduino. And then even though it's not installed, they put a link to Pico 8 front and center on their main menu. Their forums have sections dedicated to programming, and they even put on game development competitions periodically. So I think that's who they're aiming at, and I really like the idea of the community that they're trying to build around that. So if that appeals to you, then you might want to look into it. But if all that you want to do is play games, I think either of the other two are better options. So I know that's not really a clear answer to the question of which one you should buy, but hopefully I gave you enough information to where you can make that decision yourself. I'm really curious to hear from you guys though, so let me know what you think in the comments below, let me know which one you like best, and if there's something else that you would recommend over them, let me know. Also, don't forget to enter to win a GPI case from Retroflag. Huge thanks to them for doing this giveaway. Go to the link in the description and there should be an entry widget. Anyway, if you made it this far, then thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. The game shell from Clockwork Orange. Clockwork Orange. <laughs>